Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so as introduced already, we'll be talking about automating Flink deployments uh, to Kubernetes. Uh, we've actually developed a small uh, Golang uh, tool that does this for us uh, and well, automatically deploys jobs to Kubernetes. But before we dive into that, let's do a very brief uh, introduction. Yeah, so Mark Harding, uh, software engineer at Wholesale Banking and Advanced Analytics. And my name is uh, Niels Deines, I work as a data engineer in the uh, well, ING Advanced Analytics team as well. Um, so both of us working in wholesale banking advanced analytics. Uh, let's do a very brief introduction of the team. So we're a team of approximately 70 people by now uh, mo across uh, multiple countries. And our aim is to de deliver uh, data-driven products for the wholesale banking side of ING. So basically go around ING and wherever there's a use case of, uh, of data-driven products, uh, we, we try to uh, develop those. Uh, we deliver them end-to-end. -end. So in our team, we have, of course, data scientists and data engineers like us, uh, but also uh, full-stack engineers who are developing front-end and a UI and name it. Business development is all in there. Um, maybe to start off with a brief headcount, uh, who of you is using Flink in Kubernetes? Okay, a few, a few. Um, and maybe second one, who wrote their own job deployer once, either for Kubernetes or just for Flink in general? Okay, that's already a large account. <laughs> cool, so maybe that's useful for you in this talk. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll kick off. Um, we already got from the last two days that there will probably be a lot of people that actually did the same that we did. Um, we are actually hoping that by open sourcing this, of course, that we can help uh, spe spe specifically smaller companies to bootstrap their operation side of Flink. So imagine that you, uh, you work within a financial, financial markets. Um, you've got a project and it's using unbounded data sets. So we actually wanted to use Flink for that. Um, your product owner thinks of, uh, sees this as the future for the product. So it, it heavily relies on Flink that, uh, in, in the production state. Um, so imagine you've set up a job manager, a few task managers you've developed within a sprint, the first working version, uh, which you take into production. Um, a few sprints later, everything's still working fine. Product, uh, product owner comes up to you and says, hey, I've got a cool new feature. Um, we need to change the state for that. We need to update the job. So, okay, updating a job, what would that actually entail? Now, one of the big parts which has already been discussed in this, in this conference uh, is state management, of course. So we would need to do some state migrations if, uh, in our case, our case classes in, in Scala would change, um, which is outside the scope of this talk, but there definitely is also an operational side of things. So if we think about the operational side, um, deploying a sim single job is, is not that hard. You can either do it through the UI and, and just get started with a one, one click, basically. Uh, but if we want to update, there are actually a few steps that we would need to take because we definitely don't want to lose the state that we have uh, built up. Um, so yeah, if, if you're just doing it on a local, on a local machine or in a non-production environment, you could get away with just doing it manually. Just go to the UI, upload the jar, start it, uh, possibly with a save point you had. Everything's fine, right? Um, but of course, in a mature IT team, you would like to have it integrated into the rest of your pipeline um, using CI, CD. And if we were to automate it, um, we would look at it from this perspective. So the first thing that we would actually want to do is retrieve the running jobs on our cluster. Um, then we definitely need to determine if we're not running in a per job cluster, that, uh, that is, uh, which version of the job that we're trying to actually update. And the way we did is, is um, our jobs normally include a version number. So what we're actually looking at is uh, a prefix of the job name to determine which job we are actually trying to update. And based on the count of that, if there are no jobs running, we can safely assume that we just want to do a deploy. If there is one job running, uh, we definitely want to create a save point. If that all works uh, fine, uh, we want to cancel the job and eventually deploy the new, uh, the new version with the latest save point created. Now, if there are n um, items running, yeah, this, this sh shouldn't be the case in a normal, a normal situation. So we basically decided to just um, error out so that your pipeline actually shows an error and uh, you can do some manual operations on that side. So let's assume that we have a system which handles our CI CD. In our case, it's a, it's a GitLab instance. Um, so we want to set up a pipeline in GitLab which uses YAML to deploy uh, our job to the Flink job manager. Now, you could get away with just writing a simple YAML script, which executes some Flink commands if you can access Flink. Uh, you could write a simple bash script, which is actually the first step that we did. I think we wrote about a 150-line script to uh, automate a few of the steps that we needed to take. 
Um, but after a while, we felt, yeah, this, this, this works. But it's not really the, the, the same standard that we would like to have. Uh, and it's not that reliable. It's, it can't be easily tested. So we actually started debating about what we wanted to do with it. Um, so we, we, we came together, we talked about it, and we decided to build a small tool, um, which is just a high-level API that will be able to, uh, to run in Docker for us and basically support uh, either deploys or updates to existing jobs. So if we want to adhere to the same standards as other components we have, we want it to be definitely automated. We want it to be tested. Uh, we want it to be reliable. So we don't want one-off errors. We want the same result every time. Uh, we want to, oh, not sure what happened there. We want it to be maintainable. And we want it to have a small footprint. So there are a few options when you want to integrate with Flink. Um, the first one that we actually chose was the CLI. Uh, our bash script was using the CLI to just run inside one of the containers. Uh, but there are some issues with that. You have to extend from the Flink base image, which is already like 700 MB large, I think, um, which results in a longer, a longer deploy time when we need to pull the image from our, uh, from our registry. Uh, we needed to uh, include the Flink config file to be able to access the, cl the cluster. And maybe even the worst one was that we needed to parse arbitrary text output, which doesn't really feel reliable. So the second option is, of course, integrating with REST, uh, which is actually something we did a few weeks ago. So we released a new version which integrates with REST. Uh, we were able to decrease the image size to about 5 MB. Um, since we are running in Golang, it's just a simple distributable. And um, what we can now also more easily do, if there are any breaking changes in the Flink API, we would be more easily able to support multiple versions because we don't depend on the Flink base image anymore. So does that mean that we're actually done now? Yeah, so unfortunately not yet, because as we mentioned, this is a deployer that has to run on Kubernetes. And because of that, we're, uh, well, we're running a Kubernetes cluster and uh, in ING as well. Um, and our Flink jobs are running in this Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I gave a very, bro uh, very brief introduction in that uh, Kubernetes, most of you will probably know, is a container manager. Uh, so we've set up our uh, jobs in Docker containers, and those are managed by Kubernetes. Um, and indeed, like I said, uh, our Flink job are, is actually running in there. So we have job managers that are managed by Kubernetes. So Kubernetes makes sure for us that there's X amount of job managers live, X amount of task managers live, and, well, rely on that. Of course, Kubernetes also has an encapsulated network. So within this network, we uh, well, can do what we want, but not outside of it. And we'll see later on why this is important. Um, so the Flink job manager and task manager, they connect to each other uh, on the internal uh, Kubernetes network. And besides that, we have a persistent volume underneath these two uh, managers of Flink. Uh, persistent volume in our case is a NFS share. And that's where we store our save points and checkpoints. Uh, we use in our Flink jobs the file system, sorry, um, yeah, file system backend to uh, store save points and checkpoints. Um, and this persistent volume uh, keeps them uh, for us. Now let's lo have a look at how this works when we want to access this from our CI CD pipeline, because this is what Mark mentioned. We'd like to automate our deployments and not rely on manual uh, processes. Now our GitLab server is actually running on, well, what we call now the evil internet. Uh, for Kubernetes sake, that, that is actually the case. So Kubernetes has its own network and uh, there's no connection uh, inherently possible between these two. Uh, of course, you can uh, just create a route, Kubernetes, expose your job manager, uh, and thereby connect directly. Uh, but Flink, uh, Flink's UI at the moment is not uh, secured, and there's no authentication on top of it. So you don't really want to do that. Also, uh, it would increase the intact surface. Now, of course, you can uh, add an NGX, NGINX proxy or an HA proxy in front of it, uh, but that feels cumbersome and, well, as said, increases the attack surface. So we didn't want to do that. And that's actually why we decided to go with a Docker container for our uh, deployer. So what that looks like, um, our GitLab CI runner already has access to a Kubernetes cluster because we do automated deployments to Kubernetes and thereby we can easily use this to also deploy our container, uh, our deployer in a container onto the cluster. Um, yeah, so that's how, uh, this is how it looks. We deploy a container inside our Kubernetes cluster and then connect from our deployer to the job manager to perform this multi-step process and actually uh, use the internal network of, uh, of Kubernetes, uh, which ensures that we, we have no exposed uh, services of, of uh, Flink itself. So, question is then, are we done now? Because we have our Kubernetes cluster, we can do deployments from outside to our cluster. Um, well, 
not entirely yet, because if we take a small step back to our, uh, our state graph that Mark just uh, explained to you, is we have uh, a path, of course, that goes to when we have one job, uh, we create a save point for it and we cancel the job and deploy a new one. In this pipeline, we actually know the save point because we've just created it ourselves. But in the event where we have no job running at the moment, we like to retrieve the save point ourselves because that makes automation easy. And when there's nothing, no job running, we definitely never want to lose our state. So the question then is, how do we actually retrieve our latest save point? Um, and the way we've set it up actually in, uh, in Kubernetes makes this relatively easy because you may already see the Flink deployer is running inside Kubernetes. We're saving our save points and checkpoints in this persistent volume, so we can easily hook up the, the deployer to this persistent volume and retrieve the save points where needed. So that's actually what we're doing. Um, now, well, third time, are we done now? Well, yes, <laughs> well, never done. It's an evolving product, but we're done for the moment. And that's actually why I'd like to show you a brief demo of, uh, of what we have. All right, I hope this is uh, visible to all of you. So uh, on the right-hand side, we see a small Flink cluster. Um, I'm going to demo this in Docker Compose. So we have a small uh, Docker Compose uh, file that starts up a task manager and a, and a job manager in Flink. On the right, we see that there's, at the moment, no jobs uh, running. Uh, on the left, I have uh, uh, Visual Studio Code to uh, show you uh, some of the commands that we can do. Now, first thing, of course, uh, we have to deploy this job. We're going to do that using the command you see on top left. Um, our deployer actually requires, of course, a few uh, arguments like which jar do you want to deploy, what is the entry class that you want to run, which parallelism do you want to use, and uh, in this case, a program argument. Now, you'll see already in the program arguments, we'll start running a job that has an interval of one second. So if I run this here, and if all goes well, we'll see that uh, the deployer, I'm um, not sure if you all can read this, but it basically uploads the jar file uh, to the cluster and then starts the job with the parameter specified. So if we go to the Flink cluster, we can already see this job is running. And if we go to uh, the submit job, you can see that the jar is uploaded here to the cluster. OK, cool. So we have this job. What does it actually do? So let me. Uh, show you the logs of the task manager, we can see what this program does. It's a very simple word count. So all we see is uh, increasing, incrementing uh, integer. But of course, this uh, hopefully shows you the point of our state recovery, because now if we want to do an update of this job, we can take this command here, where we specify the job base name. So as Mark explained in, in, uh, in our state graph, we have to find a job that adheres to this name uh, to tell our deployer what job we want to update. And furthermore, there's a couple of the same arguments as we've seen, but including that is also a save point directory. Where do we want to save our, uh, our save point to? So let's run this one. And as per our uh, implementation, it will cancel, well, first make a save point of the previous job. So on the right hand, we'll see if, uh, one of the jobs is canceled after this, and the save point is used to restore, uh, to start up the second job. And in the left, in the task manager logs, you can see the count uh, kept on running. So cancel the job, and we updated it, basically. Uh, now, if we go to this job, we can see that uh, the checkpoint was used uh, that we just created. Now, a few other things uh, I'll briefly show as well. So we have, uh, as mentioned, the possibility that there's no job running yet, and we want to deploy a job. For that, we can actually do a deployment, uh, as we've seen in the first uh, iteration, but we actually provide a save point directory as well, thereby saying we'd like, to, uh, like you to use this save point to start this job. So if we do that, we'll basically say, just deploy a new job with the save point you find. And well, you'll see that there's now two jobs running. Yes, we just told it to deploy a new one. But you do see that uh, one of the jobs actually uh, used the last save point that was created previously. And the reason I have two running now, because normally you would never do this deploy after you already have a job running, is to show you that if we do the update again, which obviously should now fail because there's indeterministic which one of these two jobs we'd like to update. This is an invalid state, and you can see a small error here, um, which your CI would fail upon. All right, let's go back to the presentation. Yeah, so 
I guess the main thing that we would like to ask for here today, of course, is to, to know what, um, how this tool could benefit you and whether or not um, there are any use cases that we might change to, to actually help you um, in preventing from, from the implementing this yourself. So we are actually thinking about some things that, that we want. Uh, one of the things is that let's assume that there is a job running and you want to cancel it. Uh, the cancel goes fine, but your next, next version uh, starts deploying but fails after like 10 seconds. We would like to have some uh, monitoring in place that it will actually do a rollback for you uh, to the previous version um, to at least know whether or not the update actually succeeded. Uh, because you might assume just from the, the GitLab or the CI output that your job runs fine and then you find the monitoring uh, alert going off after a few minutes saying that the job failed to start. So the main thing is what would you like to see in this tool and how could we help you um, make, this, make your life easier in deploying jobs, I'd say. Now, basically, to sum up, we, uh, we built a Dockerized open source application in Golang. Um, you can find the source code on GitHub. And there's also a Medium article also uh, going into this a bit more in depth. Guess that's it. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. And do we have any questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk and thanks for open sourcing this, of course. Um, I have a question somewhat affecting your marketing. Is, is anything of this specific to Kubernetes? In, in my mind, it should just apply to people running on Yarn or wherever. Yeah, it, it is true. We can, you can apply this to any, any system, of course. Um, the Kubernetes part was more leading us into which decisions we had to make, of course, sure. because we are running in, an, in a secure ING network. Um, but definitely, you could just download the Docker file and use this somehow. Because the only thing that we now actually need, because we're using REST, is an endpoint. So if we can access your Flink job manager endpoint, it's, it should work. Yeah, and of course, you need some kind of distributed file system. But yeah. yeah, but I think you, that, you that's, do, that's do where... either way. Yeah, yeah that's, that's where the other use cases, of course, could come in handy. Um, because we're now only working with local files. So the, the jar that we're mm -hmm. actually deploying should be in the same Docker image. But we can imagine scenarios where you want to fetch it remotely, for example. Thank you. Um, do you have any plans to support the deployment model where you have a job per cluster? Because uh, the way I see it, your model depends on having one job manager sharing uh, many jobs. Uh, Not necessarily. Um, because the Docker image uh, assumes that there is a, an MFAR which says where the, the, the task or the job manager can be found to the base URL. And you should be able to run that based on your uh, GitLab pipeline or, or CI pipeline. So in that sense, it should also now already enable you to use different clusters. As long as you know in your pipeline which cluster you want to use, of course. It might, however, be a good addition to also set up clusters with this tool. We are actually debating about whether we want to take this to a next step in, in which it's not just a simple CLI, but it also knows more about your save points without having to, for example, mount the volume uh, so that it actually becomes a standalone tool which manages maybe save points in S3 or, or anything else. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions? So maybe one from me. Uh, do you handle somehow timeouts or intermittent fail failures? No, not yet. That's one of the things we also want to add. Okay. It's very optimistic at this point. Uh, so thank you very much. And now we will have uh, 30 minutes coffee break. Uh, and again, thank you, uh, Mark and Niels, for the talk. Cool.